James L. Chip Northrop worked for the oil and gas industry for over 30 years and was a partner in real estate development, um, acquisition and sale of offshore oil rigs, um, co-owner of Northrop Energy, which was sold to Arco Solar, which subsequently became BP Solar, and served on the, which was the largest solar energy company in the world at the time, and served on the governor of Texas's Energy Advisory Council. Which governor? Uh, Clemens. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure it was. Yeah, yeah, no. um, <laughs> yeah. Just to be clear about that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Please. Alternate. <laughs> yeah. He was an alternate energy planning manager for ARCO. Um, co authored one U.S. patent. Um, co founder of the White Rock Boathouse, Inc., the largest rowing boathouse in the world. Um, went to got his bachelor's from Brown University, Southern Methodist University, he got his MBA, and the Wharton School of Finance at the <coughs> University of Pennsylvania in 1976. Um, married to his lovely college sweetheart, who is here, with three four grown children. He has a blog that is fantastic. You should uh, go and read it. He's, uh, you have to remember some of the stuff he writes is very tongue-in-cheek. And even if he writes satire on the very top, people think he's being serious. So just remember that. It's, um, you should check it out at shellshockmedia.org, blog.shellshockmedia.org. Um, and he writes, he knows so much about this industry and all of its foibles, um, the jobs, mantra, everything. But I'm not real sure what he's covering exactly today because we can only cover so much. Um, Kelly is cohort and corrector, I understand, um, has years of experience as both a registered nurse and as a real estate broker. So she has multiple layers of expertise um, regarding the harms and other things of, about hydraulic fracturing. Um, Kelly is active with Middlefield Neighbors in Otsego and was active in her town's movement to ban heavy industry, including gas drilling. You may have heard of Middlefield. It won a lawsuit against it for its ban, and has been twice appealed, and is now in New York State Supreme Court for another appeal. I think they're going to win. I think it's very strong. Um, Kelly has shared her experiences with groups interested in doing the same, in saving their communities. She is very familiar with the fine points of home rule. Kelly has helped people from many upstate communities to speak out and take legislative actions about the impacts of heavy industrial gas drilling. Welcome. Thank you for coming to Green County. Yeah. By mutual agreement and a coin toss, I'm going to go first. Um, it's good to be here in Egypt. Did I pronounce that correctly? Egypt. Get that, clear that up right up front. Uh, this is a presentation that, that it's kind of, it's a preview of a presentation that I'm going to do in um, at Cornell on the 30th of this month, and it's sort of a sort of a different departure for me. Dr. Graffi is going to be there. Lou Allstadt, who is a uh, executive president, vice president at Mobil. Um, Jerry Acton, the systems engineer. And uh, Brian Brock, a retired uh, geologist. We're going to do a group presentation about what the prospects uh, are for shale gas in New York State. We've known this, or Lou Allstadt and I have known this for a couple of years. It's kind of by gentleman's agreement, at least in Lou's case, it would apply. Um, we haven't talked about it much. Uh, then Jerry Acton, the systems engineer, started to pretty much came to the same conclusion. And he started making presentations and we at that point we just decided we would probably as well get together and 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 do a joint presentation <clears throat> of which this is a part because we all had come to pretty much the same conclusions. And that is that um, at, at, at from the outset uh, there's a tendency to overstate the productivity of these horizontal shale plays. That's been 
the histories. The first horizontal uh, sh development was actually a limestone development called the Austin Shaw in Central Texas, where horizontal drilling technology was used uh, extensively and commercially and successfully. And um, the, from the outset, the, the problem was, was that, um, unlike conventional drilling, vertical drilling, so these formations can be fairly large. Uh, and the, the initial production of the wells, the horizontal wells, can be fairly, fairly high. For instance, one of the wells that was drilled in the Austin Chalk set the state record for national production for an oil well, an all time state record, because of the nature of the technology. And if you put those two things together, this you know this large spatial area of of the reservoir and the, these high initial productions, it tends to be misleading because in other words you've got this you're looking at this massive area. In the case of the Marcellus, it's you know it's huge. Uh, and then you look at these what often very high production, and you put the two together mentally and you extrapolate. You think, my God, you know that's like wow in Saudi Arabia. And of course, the news always, um, or typically, they will um, uh, promote or they'll um, uh, talk about the gushers, about the top producers. They make the news. The dry holes hardly ever make the news unless they have a problem with them, unless they leak. So, so anyway, so you've got kind of three. <coughs> Sort of things that can tend to be misleading. You've got this great area. Um, you have these uh, high initial productions that are typical of most of the producing wells. And then you have the news media talking about the gushers. And then the, you know, the gusher story would, would entail the landowner or whatever, the operator that drilled the gusher. And that kind of that, that makes that can end up being a little misleading. The, the um, the nature of the of a conventional well, a vertical well, is, is that it, it hits a trap uh, of oil or gas, and it's the spatial extent can that would be to the left that uh, Derek um, uh, tapping into a, a a pocket of gas. It's in a trap. It tends to be limiting by just the the size of that trap. So in other words, you drill a well, a step out well away from the discovery well, and at some point you begin to get a sense of how big that that a field would be typically not very large. And as opposed to, say, the shale formation, which can extend, like in the case of the Marcellus under virtually an entire state, the Pennsylvania. So that uh, right from the outset, when you get wells into a shale formation, the, the gushers are going to be overstated. And since the shale formation is pervasive in some areas, then Again, you 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 begin to. It's easy to sort of think in terms of having a gusher throughout that entire area. It's by and just to tell you right up front, it's never happens that way. I mean, that what I just said happens, but it's never. It's the it's ne those these shale formations or horizontal formations or formations that are drilled horizontal are never universally productive, amorphous. The sort of the hot shale play before the Marcellus, and they, they've gone kind of in sequence, at least in the media, was the Haynesville, which was in uh, many counties in eastern Texas and, and central um, Louisiana, going up towards uh, Arkansas. And initially, because of the size of the formation, uh, there was a lot of leasing activity. There was a lot of optimism about it. What happened was is that, and this is true of all these formations, is, is that the actual productive area then would consolidate fairly rapidly into what amounted to right at the corner of three counties, meaning um, towards the end of its productivity, it's, it's not very productive now because of the price of gas. This is it, it, if it went from being a, a very large area in Texas and Louisiana into being just the corner of three counties. And uh, the re there's a lot of reasons for that, but the, but the, the fact is, is that the shale itself is not, um, it's the productivity of it is not important. In fact, it, it varies a lot. In the Hainesville, there's, <coughs> there's, there's, a, there's all sorts of variables. This is, the, this is a map of the 
the sort of the gross area of the, uh, of the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, southeast uh, or southwest Pennsylvania uh, to the left, northeast to the right. So the, the, the counties of Bradford, Susquehanna, that are adjacent to New York are shown in the upper right. And the, the blue area is basically areas where it's not productive at all. Uh, light blue uh, subpar, the white areas would be the, considered average for the Marcellus. And then the darker areas, the yellow, red, would be high, high production areas. So Dimmock is kind of right in the middle of, that, of those that top three counties there for the town in Bradford County. And that's, that's what you hear about. That's what gets covered in the press. And there's not, you know, you don't hear too much about the dry holes. You do hear lately, or in the last year or so, about rigs moving out of this area and going to, to Ohio and, and other places. The, the way that, uh, the, the problem with, with, with all this is, well, for, for openers, is it's very easy to gain this financially. What you, in other words, if you, once a shale basin is identified, uh, operators will come and lease up as much of it as they can, as inexpensively as they can, and frankly, for as long as they can. Uh, they will drill test wells, and then they will take the results of the best wells, and they will extrapolate them over their holdings, and you know, tell the, the financial press and the, the popular press that. You know, they've got so many acres leased in such and such a state, and that they hit a well in such and such a town, and that did so and so. Uh, they'll, they'll mask their bad results, and, and usually the, there's code words for this, but it's like, you know, the, it's like operator error. If they, don't, if they don't like the well, then they have a problem with the well. You know, they had to go fish something out of it, or, you know, they had a problem with it. But it, they'll, they, then of course if they don't tie it in, if they don't produce it, it won't even get reported. It won't get reported that it's being, in Texas and in Oklahoma and other states, what would happen with the well? So you wouldn't want to talk about it, you just say you would temporarily abandon it, or it was waiting on, you know, gathering. You wouldn't actually, you wouldn't go to the, you wouldn't classify as plugged and abandoned because then you're basically admitting that it's a black, a black, a black, black, a dry hole. Uh, and there's wells in Louisiana that have been temporarily abandoned on the books for decades. Because the other problem with, 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 the, with the dry hole, obviously, is you have a liability, a plugging and abandonment liability uh, that you have to fulfill on the well. So, so you hear about the gushers and you don't know, hear about the, uh, the bad results. And then, of course, they, they take what they've, the acreage that they've, that they've claimed to have proven up and then they just flip it. And go to another state or go to another part of the state. And that's, you know, in a, in a nutshell, that's what happened with Chesapeake and some of these other, and they would, and particularly like back in the Haynesville, as they basically flipped, if you will, in a grand manner, uh, their acreage to a, a foreign company. Uh, they earned their, their acreage in, in the Fayetteville too. So uh, the, way, the way this happens, though, and I'll get to the financial part about this. In a minute, is is that you would um, you'd see that you would drill, oh, say a below average well, uh, in a, in an acreage that you leased up, and you wouldn't produce it. You'd test it, you'd log it, whatnot. Then you'd drill a dry hole, say, in the same acreage you leased. Then you might drill and test what looked to be an above average, another above average, a dry hole. And you, maybe you can see where I'm going with this. <laughs> slightly below average, slightly below. None of these have been produced. I mean, they may have been test frag, and they would test the, uh, uh, the, the gas, but they won't actually hook them up. And then guess what? And then if I can get this thing to work. Uh, it's, I'm a Mac guy living in a PC world. Um, then they get a big well. And then they, they frack it, they tie it up, they produce it. And under the regs, under the Security <coughs> Exchange Commission regs, which we'll talk about here as soon as I can get the thumb to pull. Let's go ahead and do that. Go ahead and walk over here. Um, then they'll take this whole acreage that they have tied up, 
and because they produce the big well and they, you know, have a problem <laughs> with the other well, then, then that's how they will report it. That that, they'll claim that that acreage, uh, you know, is, um, is above average. What do you know? Now, the way that they're a they've been able to do this is before um, Cheney and Bush, the governor that I didn't work for, <laughs> um, left the White House in October of 2008, is they changed, or Chris Cox, who was the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, they changed the regs on how you can report reserves, undeveloped reserves, I mean, uh, reserves that aren't producing. And they, they basically liberalized it, which is, you know, kind of an odd adjective for Cheney and Bush. But they made, they made it easier to extrapolate uh, or to apply, um, call it good results over a larger area. So in other words, they facilitated it under the scripts exchange room, the financial reporting, the ability to do what I just showed you, take good results and extrapolate it over a large area. So what happened almost immediately is, is that reserves that weren't actually producing, or area, part of the areas that they had put in the least that they weren't actually producing, came onto the books of these public companies as being great reserves uh, based on basically some chicanery. And they, they, the, the way you do this is, is that you get a petroleum reserve engineer like Neville and Sewell in Houston to basically give you a good number. And, you know, as like we learned in Wharton, the, 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 you know, the, if, and when it comes to doing an appraisal or financial accounting, a balance uh, um, uh, evaluation, you basically, you give it to the accountant. The, the, the right answer is like, you know, what number do you have in mind? So they get the job. And, and it's not like all Perdola Reserves engineers are liars, but I mean, they, under these new rules, they were able to take what they had traditionally been constrained in doing and inflate those, those, uh, those reserves. So this is kind of where the bubble, you know, the shale gas bubble actually started. It started in the same place as the subprime mortgage bubble. It started on Wall Street. You know, it wasn't like, remember this at this, at this time, horizontal uh, drilling, you know, we're in frack, hydrofracking, horizontal hydrofracking. High volume, was over 20 years old. It started back in the Austin Chalk and then it moved to the San Juan Basin and the Coal Sink. So it, it wasn't like the tip, there was like this sea change in this. It was just a sea change in the. It was, a, it was basically uh, Cheney's last hurrah before, the, you know, before he got the limo and left town. And of course, ha Halliburton, who developed um, this technology, was a great beneficiary of this. Well, there's a, there's a button down here somewhere, and I can't find it. Is there another way to make this thing? Cooperate? Excuse me, 